in listen only mode. Muy bien, muy buenos días a, a todos. Me da mucho gusto en nombre del de secretario Pedro Joaquín Cordwell y de, de su secretario Leonardo Belchar, darles la más, la más cordial bienvenida. Me acompañan esta mañana el maestro Odón de Buen, director general de la CONUE, la licenciada Gabriela Reyes, directora de aprovechamiento sustentable de la energía de la CENER, y además nuestro invitado especial, es un gusto para mí presentar a Philippe Benoit, director de la División de Eficiencia Energética y Ambiente Climático de la Agencia Internacional de Energía. Seas bienvenido, Philippe. Además, quiero saludar a todas las personas que nos acompañan en este, en este webinar. Tenemos casi 40 personas conectadas en este, en este momento, adicionalmente a las personas que se encuentran aquí en este recinto de la sala de uso múltiple Fernando Idear de, de la Secretaría de Energía. Y si me lo permiten, para no, no extenderme mucho, voy a, a leer una breve semblanza de Philippe Benoit. Actualmente, Philippe está a cargo de la División de Eficiencia, de Eficiencia Energética y Ambiente de la Agencia Internacional de Energía. Esta división se encarga de promover el uso de la eficiencia energética dado sus beneficios económicos, energéticos y climáticos, por el análisis de una serie de cuestiones relacionadas con el cambio climático, incluyendo el uso de la captura y almacenamiento de carbono para la mitigación. La división está en activo en los países de la OECD y ha ampliado sus actividades en las economías emergentes como India, México, Sudáfrica y China. El señor Benoit anteriormente se desempeñó como gerente del sector de energía de la región de Latinoamérica, y el Caribe del Banco Mundial, y de trabajo de análisis de la unidad, incluyendo estudios sobre estrategias de crecimiento con bajas emisiones de carbono para México, Brasil y Colombia, analizando el papel de la eficiencia energética en los objetivos económicos y de mitigación climática, en la gestión de los cortes de electricidad y en la promoción de proyectos eólicos ambientalmente amigables. También dirigió el programa de préstamos de la unidad, que pasó de 100 millones a más de 1.000 millones de por año, con un enfoque en las energías renovables y otras tecnologías bajas en carbono. El señor Benoit trabajó anteriormente como director de la división de petróleo y gas de SG Investment Bank, enfocado en Europa Sur Oriental y en el Medio Oriente y el Norte de África. Antes de unirse al Banco Mundial, el señor Benoit también trabajó como abogado corporativo en Wall Street. Tiene un doctorado en leyes, un laude de la Facultad de Derecho en Harvard, y una licenciatura en Economía y Ciencias Políticas Magna Cum Laude de la Universidad de Yale. También posee un título de posgrado en Derecho Mercantil de la Universidad de París. Así que, pues me da mucho gusto recibir a un gran amigo de la Secretaría de Energía, un gran amigo de México, Philippe Benoit, director de la División de Eficiencia Energética y Ambiente Climático de la Agencia Internacional de Energía. Welcome, Philippe. It's a great honor to have you here. Uh, gracias por uh, estas palabras uh, muy uh, gentiles. Uh, <laughs> yo voy a empezar. Voy a, voy a empezar la presentación en... en español. pero voy solamente a hablar unas o dos palabras y después voy a pasar a inglés porque es más fácil. So, I'm speaking English. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, as Santiago uh, mentioned, uh, I have a real affection for Mexico. In fact, uh, during my years as the sector manager for energy for Latin America at the World Bank, uh, the favorite country I had to work on was Mexico and I used to come about three or four times a year. Uh, and after I left to join the IA, I felt, well, that was a real shame that I wouldn't have another opportunity to come. So we developed a program, figured out a way to develop a program to give me an opportunity to come back. So uh, this is all an excuse just for me to be able to come back and see uh, all the wonderful things that are happening uh, in Mexico. Uh, I'm from New York, so I tend to talk very, very quickly, but I'm going to uh, make an effort really to slow things down because obviously, in particular, for those people who are participating uh, through the webinar, 
it's more difficult to understand what's going on. What I would like to do is really describe to you uh, a work stream that we've developed at the IA that focuses in strategically on ways to improve the uh, amount of investment in energy efficiency. And in that regard, before you, need, before you can get to investment, you really need to have interest uh, in energy efficiency. And what we see when we look at energy efficiency is that uh, it's not simply about uh, generating energy savings. Uh, it's not just simply about uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in fact, energy efficiency provides a variety of benefits, what we like to call multiple benefits. So, by way of illustration, uh, at the IEA, we did an analysis and we looked at uh, the amount of economically profitable energy efficiency investments that could be made. Economically profitable meaning investments that would generate a sufficient rate of return over about a four or five year period. And when we analyzed that, we saw that basically if the world were to undertake these investments, we would see significant increases in GDP growth and you see uh, how that increase plays out for a variety of different countries. Fundamental point here is that energy efficiency is pro-growth. Uh, doing more energy efficiency will, in most countries and in countries like Mexico, increase uh, the overall gross domestic product. But having said that, we also looked at, given current policies and practices, how much of these investments were likely to take place. And what was surprising, and it's reflected in this graph, is that, in fact, only about one-third of the economically profitable energy efficiency investments were, are likely to take place given current policies and practices. And what you see here in this diagram uh, is what that looks like across critical sectors. So, for example, in industry, not surprisingly, we have a large number of big companies, about 40%, relatively larger amount of energy efficiency investments will take place under current policies and practices. <coughs> and it's interesting when you compare that, for example, in buildings, where we project that less than 20% of the economically profitable projects will actually get done. What does that mean, put another way? Over two-thirds of the potential investments in economically profitable projects will not get done. That means that for every dollar that we are likely to invest in an energy efficiency money-making activity, two dollars will go uninvested. And that means we're leaving a lot of money on the table. So let me give you one of the illustrations as, as to why we face this problem. It's very interesting. When we build uh, a power plant, even a renewables power plant, something like a hydropower plant at Leicester, or if we drill oil wells. Every year after we build the plant, we come in and we will measure the amount of electricity that's being produced or the amount of oil that's coming out. Can't rail, the amount's going down, but still we're able to measure how many barrels of oil are coming out. There are many old uh, hydropower plants in Mexico that are producing uh, electricity year after year after year, and 10 or 20 years later, we're measuring them and we're saying to ourselves, we did a good job in making that investment. But by comparison, when we look at energy efficiency investments, so for example, uh, if we improve uh, standards for lighting, if we improve insulation, if we improve fuel economy uh, standards, what we find is we very quickly forget about that investment, even though it too, like producing uh, hydropower or producing uh, oil will produce benefits. When the house is better insulated, every year from then on, it will consume less heat, it will need less air conditioning. When people put in more efficient air conditioners into their homes, every single year, so long as they maintain those air conditioners, they will produ be producing savings. And this is something that we quickly forget. So we find ourselves in some ways when we look at energy efficiency as an alternative, really, to putting solar uh, panels on the roofs, doing ins better insulation and better air conditions as opposed to putting solar panels or building 
uh, a big uh, coal power plant or a gas power plant. We're actually not looking at a level playing field. We're actually looking at one where, for a variety of reasons, energy efficiency operates at a disadvantage. And the implication of that, from our perspective, means underinvestment in energy efficiency. And this is an illustration of this point. Three years ago, the IEA uh, did an analysis and it projected, it looked at the United States, and it projected what was going to be the impact of shale oil and shale gas. And a lot of the press came out and said, wow, a major implication of the IEA analysis is that by 2026, 2027, the United States is going to be essentially a net energy exporter. And one of the big reasons for that is because oil imports were going to drop, and oil imports were going to drop. Why? Because of shale gas and shale oil. Everybody loves to talk about shale gas, shale oil. And that's what you have here described in the purple line. But interestingly enough, if you look at 2025, 40 percent, this is the drop in oil imports in the United States. 40 percent of the drop in oil imports, which is reflected in the green, comes from demand side interventions. This was not all a question of producing more oil and producing more gas. This was also very much the result of a concerted effort within the United States to improve fuel economy standards and one that continues. And in fact, when there are discussions today about the fact that oil prices have dropped. What do they talk about? They say demand has dropped. And one of the structural changes that people talk about in terms of the drop in demand for oil, gasoline specifically, is the increase in fuel economy standards. All the sit there and say that energy efficiency is a big part of our energy landscape, and it is a tool that we need to do a better job about using. Even if we want to talk about climate change, when we at the IEA look to the future and say, how can we achieve the two-degree uh, objective that was agreed uh, at COP here in Cancun? We look at a variety of different technologies to get us from the high emissions path of a six-degree world to the low emissions path, path of a two-degree world. And so we look at things like more for efficient power generation, uh, renewables, uh, end-use fuel, fuel switching from coal to gas, biofuels, carbon capture and storage. But what's interesting in this is that the largest contributor to that decarbonization is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency, from our projections, should provide 40% of the decarbonization that we need to move from a business as usual case to a two degree case. So energy efficiency is not only simply a question of the fact that when we're not adequately exploiting it, we're leaving a lot of money on the table. The fact of the matter is, it is the major tool that we have to fight climate change. And implicit with that uh, are a variety of investment numbers. What you have here is an estimate of uh, how much uh, will be made globally in terms of investments in uh, over the next 22 years in our energy sector. And what you have in the orange line, uh, fossil fuels, this is uh, power, transmission, and distribution, uh, a variety of low-carbon investments in renewables, and we estimate that over the next 22 years, we will invest $8 trillion in energy efficiency. That's a large number. That represents uh, probably about $350, $400 million on average. The key thing is that if we wanted to get to the two degrees, what you'll see is there isn't a big change in fossil fuels. It goes down about three or four billion, uh, power transmission, uh, stays about the same. It's actually a little higher, uh, probably uh, in, in the higher uh, carbon case. There's obviously a big shift in terms of investments in renewables and the like, but the biggest shift and the biggest change actually comes from the fact that we will need to invest an additional six trillion dollars in energy efficiency. Put it another way, the IEA came out with a market report in which we estimate total energy efficiency investments globally we estimate them at $300 billion a year globally. Now, $300 billion a year globally is actually more than we're investing in renewables. But the issue is that in order for us to get to $14 trillion, we will need to double the annual investment in energy efficiency. And so at the IA, we think very hard about ways in which we can figure out how we can 
encourage people to make the investments in, I stress this point, economically profitable projects that are not otherwise uh, going to be uh, benefiting from investments. So, you know, when we talk about energy efficiency, we think it's part of the challenge we have is it's, it's kind of boring, it's kind of technical, it's kind of diffuse, uh, and traditionally energy efficiency has been simply in the realm of energy specialists. How many energy specialists do we have in the room? <laughs> I'm not, I mean, not energy specialists do we have. How many people said, oh, wow, they're going to be talking about energy efficiency. Let me go to that. You know? I'm sure, I promise you, we, when, when, when my colleagues do presentations on renewables, you have a whole slew of people who come in and want to talk about renewables. They want to go hug a tree. They want to go hug a polar bear. They want to go talk about renewables. So, or if you want to talk about shale gas and shale oil, then you'll have all these geopolitical people coming. Oh, this is strategic. This is a fundamental change in the geopolitics of the United States and the world. Uh, the Seventh Fleet is no longer going to have to go to Arabia. It's going to be a Chinese fleet that's going to come. All of these massive discussions around these issues. And in fact, when we talk about energy efficiency, we only seem to have energy efficiency experts in the room. And it's interesting when you think back to that other diagram I showed, where 40% of the drop in uh, oil imports into the United States is the result of energy efficiency. Look at the price of a barrel of oil, $50 a day. A lot of that comes from energy efficiency. So what we recognize, or sort of felt looking at it from the other side, is that, in fact, energy efficiency provides a variety of different benefits. And for what you could divide them in different ways. But here, we use this approach. It provides benefits at the individual level poverty alleviation and the like. We know that when Mexico carried out its very successful uh, bulb substitution program, they were all directed at poorer families. And poorer families uh, then were able to give up more expensive incandescent bulbs in terms of consumption for freer, for less expensive um, CFL bulbs that were given to them. There was an appliance program as well uh, that was done. So we know that it provides a variety of poverty uh, alleviation efforts at the individual level. At the sexual level, improves productivity in the life. Uh, and macroeconomically, critical issues about energy security. It's clear that, for example, in a country like Mexico, the more efficient Mexico can get in its building stock will have implications in terms of how much gas Mexico has to import uh, from abroad. And these so it present obviously important macroeconomic effects uh, in the life. And then obviously the one that actually has given a breath of uh, a wind into the sales of energy efficiency are the internationals. One everybody likes to talk about is climate change. Uh, at the same time, we realize that sometimes talking about too much climate change can be problematic because some people feel that climate change is really a, a way, uh, an anti-growth strategy. That's not really our perspective, but having said that, fundamentally, energy efficiency is pro-growth and does a variety of, variety of things as improving resource management. Again, this whole issue of as oil prices drop, we're looking at a situation where demand has dropped. It's not just for the system. There are clearly structural changes that have occurred as a result of energy efficiency. Uh, and that is then obviously going to have an impact on the need to go deep offshore and deeper, deeper offshore, uh, which prevents, presents a variety of uh, security risks and the like. So uh, energy efficiency really provides a variety of different benefits. And what we feel uh, is critical in order to promote increased intention in energy efficiency is that we need to reach out, we need to reach out to non-energy specialists. What we need to do is we need to build bridges. We need to get other people interested in energy efficiency because it meets their goals, not an energy savings goal, not a climate goal, but their goals. What there is, is for example, I'll come back to this, uh, the issue of uh, education, uh, whether it's an issue of health, uh, whether it's an issue of improved uh, balance of trade. And it's very interesting when you think about it. Uh, uh, energy efficiency is a subject that doesn't just cut across in the traditional sort of OECD, non-OECD, uh, developed, developing world manner. Uh, energy efficiency is a critical issue uh, from a security perspective for countries like Japan, Korea, and Jamaica that are all island states. Island states are very, very concerned about energy security and dependence on fuel imports. 
energy efficiency helps them deal with that issue together with uh, renewables. So what we really see is that energy efficiency has a variety of benefits that cut across a variety of, of the traditional uh, distinctions. And our effort to this uh, work is to sit there and build bridges to these uh, other non-energy experts. And obviously, one of the critical partners is really the public at large. Part of our challenge is to figure out a way as to how we can capture the imagination of the public. Again, let me put this in the context. The reason we're spending so much time on this issue from our side is twofold. The first is we are leaving a lot of growth opportunities on the table because energy efficiency is underexploited. And the second is when we look at it in terms of the climate change objective, we will not get anywhere close to where we need to be if we are not more serious about energy efficiency. And so we feel that it's very important to build these bridges and to build these uh, alliances. And one of the big uh, uh, constituents out there that we have to work with is the public. When I talk to my colleagues who do with renewables, I'm often jealous of them because the renewables people have managed to capture the imagination of the public. Uh, the number of times that my children have come in and have had a project that has to do with renewables is fascinating. Uh, windmills or things like that, that they do, it's been internalized into the educational system. And at the end of the day, they all feel that, well, renewables is a public good. You know, in some ways, when you think about what happened in Germany, uh, where they had a very high feed-in tariff to promote solar, the fact of the matter is, in many ways, the Germans knew that they were overpaying for solar. Now they're a little tired of doing it, but for the first five or seven years, they knew it and they were happy to do it. Why? Because they felt it was the right thing to do to promote a sustainable future. This is the story and challenge that we have on energy efficiency. So you can see part of the challenge is to try to make energy efficiency kind of more captivating to other people. So, this is possible que este experimentando en problemas de conexión. So, okay then. So what we came up with in the strategic effort was this multiple benefits of energy efficiency, sometimes people call it a flower, was to say, look, energy efficiency generates important benefits. I talked about some of the energy prices, macroeconomic, and even things like access. The fact of the matter is that uh, we see in many, many countries, especially poor countries that have access problems, part of the issue they have is inefficiencies on the supply side. Rather than spending the time to say, it's very interesting, a lot of coal companies are very interested in promoting the access agenda for poor countries. And a lot of time, that agenda is around, let's build another coal-powered plant, when in fact, what is normally much more efficient is let's reduce the amount of technical losses that are in the distribution system and the transmission system. The best, most cleanest, most efficient way to increase access is first to reduce the large levels of uh, technical inefficiencies that you have in precisely those countries that have access. So just a recognition of a uh, variety of different benefits out there, and this we call our uh, multiple benefits flower. So the purpose uh, of the work is to raise awareness uh, around energy efficiency and these benefits to increase the quality of the analysis of uh, these other complementary benefits, to develop methodological tools, and to build capacities in countries to do this. Uh, and one thing, for example, is we have been organizing a series of workshops uh, in India and in South Africa. Uh, and in other countries that are really designed to support countries and cities in improving their ability to analyze, okay, if I want to do an energy efficiency operation, I'm in the Ministry of Housing, what are the benefits that I get? And I'll come back to this in just a second. Our initial focus was on five types of benefits, macroeconomic benefits, because obviously that's the overarching one, but to be frank, that's the one that's been analyzed the most uh, in many, many countries. Secondly, we wanted to look at public budgets. What is the impact of energy efficiency on public budgets, on municipalities, but only not just municipalities, also smaller uh, public agencies. For example, ministries of education. How much money do ministries of education actually spend 
in lighting schools and heating schools. Part of the problem we have a lot of time is the Ministry of Education will not focus on energy consumption issues. They'll focus on paying teachers and the like. Uh, and in fact, there are some major opportunities there to uh, generate savings. That's true uh, in health uh, and other places. Another good example of that are actually water companies. Water companies are major consumers of energy. And working with water companies to basically improve the efficiency with which they can deliver water has a potential benefit of beneficial impact on public budgets. Health, industrial productivity, and energy providers. And I've got a slide on each, so let me just take them through. So in terms of uh, overarching macroeconomic impact, I won't spend a lot of time. You in Mexico, in your analysis, have looked, have looked at this issue. There are investment uh, effects by investing in energy efficiency operations and the like. There are obviously always uh, the issue of uh, reduced energy demand. Our tendency is always to tend to focus in on uh, how we make money from the fact that we reduce something and we sometimes forget that there are also important investment effects. Uh, the fact of the matter is while there are a lot of countries all over the world that have analyzed this issue, this is still an area that deserves greater attention. I discussed the issue about uh, impact on public budgets. Uh, cities, as I mentioned, are critical municipalities. I know that Mexico and Sonera are engaging in a program with a variety of cities uh, to improve uh, energy efficiency programs there. And let me just say, this is kind of also illustrative of part of the challenge that we have. Uh, one, one issue that we have is in terms of capacity. The fact of the matter is that doing energy efficiency programs tend to be, as a general proposition, somewhat complex in part because people aren't familiar with it. And as a result, when you start getting down to subnational entities, such as cities, you'll often find that there are not sufficient number of energy efficiency experts in the city to fully analyze and implement an energy efficiency program. So as a result, very naturally, the city will say, well, I prefer to build another power plant outside my area rather than spend time figuring out how to do an energy efficiency program. And if I could say in the Mexican context, I think arguably this situation is exacerbated, made more difficult by the overlap of the energy efficiency issue with your political cycle. Because in fact, normally, unfortunately, it takes a while for an energy efficiency project to get up and running, and then you don't necessarily end up with a nice ribbon cutting event. And so given the fact that you have mayors who tend to be in power a limited amount of time, the ability to re-elect the mayor, means that at the end of the day, for very reasonable political reasons, if you go into a mayor and say, I've got this great energy efficiency project designed to improve uh, street lighting, it'll save the city X, Y, and Z, it doesn't necessarily get a lot of attention because sometimes the major impacts are felt outside of the electoral uh, project. This is a problem, uh, in, in, this is a, an issue to, to look at uh, in Mexico, but it's true, it's an issue in, in, other, in other places. Uh, I mentioned the issue about municipal utilities and other issues about public buildings. And I'll give you an illustration there. So for example, uh, as I said, we're doing a lot of work in, in, in South Africa. It turns out most of the public buildings are rented, rented under 30, 40, 50 year leases. And lighting is in the rent. So, you know, well, this is in there, so there's not a good example, but I say, you know, so if we were in the Ministry of Health, it's in the lighting is in the rent. Nobody's going to pay that much close attention. And in fact, the meter, there's only one meter, and it's in the basement. So nobody really has any idea what's going on in terms of electricity consumption. If they did simple things like put meters at every floor and had it recorded, you'd probably find naturally people tend to look and say, oh, we're wasting money. Let's turn off the light when we're not there the entire weekend. So the issue of public buildings is also a major point. What are the type of impacts we see on public budgets? Interestingly enough, obviously I tend to focus a lot on energy savings effects, but there are also investment effects because obviously promoting things like new street lighting uh, and other things generates uh, investment, uh, which then can increase uh, sales tax revenues uh, and the like. But again, the fundamental point here is to say energy efficiency can have significant impacts on the bu budgets of cities, of a variety of agencies and the like, and it is probably worth working with those entities to see if there's a way of improving uh, their efficiency with which they consume energy. 
how this is one that I always like uh, talking about because for me it was striking when we went through this this process. Um, when somebody says energy efficiency to me in health, I say, oh yeah, of course, uh, air pollution, because basically in China they're promoting uh, more efficient air conditions and light so they don't have to run their coal power plants as much and you reduce smog. In fact, there's also an interesting amount of study regarding the impact of energy efficiency on indoor exposure factors. That when you have a home that is well insulated, uh, when you have uh, heat, HVAC heating and, and ventilation air conditioning systems that are well run, uh, what you end up is a situation in which the quality of the air in the home is better and people get sick less. And in fact, New Zealand did a study, which is one reason we have a whole chapter on this. Uh, they did a study on this and they found that for every dollar that they invested in improving indoor efficiency, the energy efficiency of homes, they had a $4 reduction in health expenditures. Now, this was for, and this is interesting enough, in poorer families. So there was very much of a social dimension issue here. Uh, that in fact, going into poorer homes and the like and making this effort about improving something as boring and uninteresting as windows and, 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 and the like actually has a major uh, payback. Uh, this is also something that they're looking at a lot in the UK. And just to give you a sense of the issue, what you have here is when you have a problem with thermal quality, dampness, air quality, these are the types of uh, things that come out. Arthritis, rheumatism, cardio disease, and the like. And obviously, we're talking about normally poor homes. But I think it's clear when you look at the Mexican context, think about, uh, in particular, the areas that get cold at a variety of times, this is going to be an issue. It's true in New Zealand. It's going to be true uh, in Mexico. Uh, and it's actually very true in the United Kingdom. And they have done some work. And here you see the logic of it, which is that basically there's an extensive body of research looking for energy efficiency and high, high fuel costs to low indoor temperatures and poor housing conditions. And that translates into implications on health and well-being outcomes. In Peru, precisely, one of the biggest issues so, in terms of housing, uh, they have a big problem housing, has to do with the community. So again, this is where energy, so in fact, health ministries should work hand in hand with energy ministries uh, to, to, to uh, in, improve that. So I think that's, that's, a type of, that's a type of building bridges and thinking out of the box that we are trying to promote uh, through this energy efficiency, multi capturing multiple benefits of energy efficiency. And then you have all the benefits of, of improving the situation. So um, there was also oh, actually interesting enough in Australia, they did a study. They had a program in Australia to promote energy efficiency in commercial buildings. And they came back three years later and they analyzed the results. Now the basic purpose was, as you can imagine, to generate energy savings. But they were surprised to find out that one, actually, one of the biggest results, positive results they had, was <coughs> improved uh, worker productivity. They actually found that in the buildings where they had done this effort of improving the insulation and the, and the like, worker productivity increased absenteeism, diminished and the like. So very important ties into issues such as industrial productivity, which brings me to the fourth one that we analyze, industrial productivity. Now, this is kind of a funny one because um, on the one hand, and this is where I always sit there, I know I start us off by saying that, I have a French name, but I'm actually American, um, and in America, you know, money drives a lot of a lot of issues. And there's a big myth out there, and the big myth out there is that the private sector will do whatever it is that's necessary to make money. And if they're not doing it, it's probably because it doesn't make money. That is a myth. Now, what we find when it comes to uh, industrial industrial issues that larger, the largest companies that are basically large enough to have enough people to start thinking about energy efficiency tend to do a fair amount on energy efficiency. But the moment you get beneath the largest companies, 
what you tend to find is very little is done in terms of energy efficiency. For example, in small and medium-sized enterprises. And in some sense, it's not that surprising. And I'd say for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, you have a skills issue, which is do you have the critical mass enough people to sit and think about what the energy efficiency operations are. But the related point is that fundamentally, most businesses, all businesses, don't really aspire to becoming more efficient. They typically aspire to becoming bigger and more profitable and bigger and bigger and bigger. So what tends to happen is, like sometimes I remember once having this discussion with one of your predecessors, actually, Santiago, um, and we were talking about energy efficiency kind of in the Mexican context. And he said, yeah, I hear everything you're saying. But for me, at the end of the day, energy efficiency sounds like downsizing. Sounds to me like you want us to get smaller on some level. And that is a basic issue that we have with energy efficiency. People think about energy efficiency, cost savings. And when you're in a bull market and you want to grow, you're not interested. You're not going to send your resources to figure out how you can save costs. If you're in the business of selling insurance or selling uh, travel, uh, you're, in the, you're in the tourism business. What you want to do, what everybody in the business knows best to do, is to figure out a way to sell more insurance products, better insurance products where you make more money, or to sell more travel packages and likely you make more money. Energy efficiency is not really within the business plan. And so as a result, it becomes difficult to get businesses to focus in on energy efficiency, except to the extent that we can try to get them to focus in on it as a value creation. Uh, uh, proposition. It's not just about saving, it's about value creation. So yes, making it more profitable, but also, guess what, lo and behold, what happens when you try to become more efficient? You have a lot of other positive spin-offs. You end up thinking a little more about all your systems. You end up becoming more efficient as a general proposition, and this is the type of positive output you can get in terms of it. Now here you have some of the type of areas that energy efficiency uh, can have benefits in competitiveness, production, working environments, uh, operations, and maintenance. But the fundamental point is we have a real need to try to work with uh, based on the bottom 90% of enterprises in the world to get them to realize that, in fact, there is an efficient way for them to improve their efficiency. And doing that requires a variety of government and canoe programs that are designed to allow these companies to draw on the expertise in an efficient manner where they don't have to have a lot of transaction costs. And finally, another one is energy providers. FEMEX, and mostly here, CFD. Utilities tend to like to have more and more assets. That's really the culture of utilities everywhere. And obviously, there are a lot of also financial incentives that are designed to remunerate them based on their assets. So a big challenge that we have is to try to get to utilities that are responding to a regulatory framework, among other ones, to move to a system where it's not just a question of more and more assets generating more and more electricity, but giving value to the electricity that they don't have to generate while still being able to provide the amount of services. The easy case is the case I gave about access, where if you have a lot of losses in your uh, transmission and distribution system because you have an increasing uh, load. Okay, that's easier to figure out. Okay, we need to put more and more transformers. But as a general proposition, what we see is to compare the costs uh, in making energy efficiency as compared to the benefits, whether it's energy generation, distribution capacity, reducing line losses, CO2 emissions. There are a variety of benefits that energy producers, utilities like CFE or even IPPs and the like, can generate for themselves and for society uh, that are worth this in. Because I think the critical point to, to recognize here is that if you look at the overall economic situation in Mexico, Mexico, all of Mexico benefits arguably by having to import fewer, uh, fewer uh, MMBTUs from the United States and gas and the like. So pushing energy efficiency allows one also to rely more on domestic resources. One thing is this, energy efficiency is homegrown. It is not imported. When you put that insulation in your roof, your roof is going to be generating that benefit. When you put that more efficient uh, air conditioning system in there, the savings is generated in Mexico by Mexico. 
You don't need to import gas or oil from another country. And this we also find is something that doesn't get enough attention. We're going to focus a little more on this issue in our, in our publication next year. Finally, what I'd like to talk about is the rebound effect. How many are here are familiar with the rebound effect? Okay, so let me just describe the rebound effect just for a second. Because I think the description is relevant as well as the fact that I have to have a slide on the description is relevant. Okay. <laughs> the rebound effect is this, is this theory that basically says, and it's like relevant in a country uh, like, like Mexico, which is that basically if you have a household, and uh, let's just say a, a relatively poor household, uh, and they're spending a certain amount on uh, lighting because they had five inefficient bulbs and they had inefficient appliances and the like. If you put in more efficient um, appliances, then that will reduce their energy consumption. So as much as they put into an inefficient one, they now have less energy consumption because the more efficient refrigerator doesn't mean as much energy. So you could go out and say, oh, so that's the amount of savings. But in fact, what tends to happen is now that household basically has 10 pesos more a month. And with those 10 pesos, it's going to go out and it's going to spend money. And one thing it's probably going to spend money on is something that consumes more energy. So you have this rebound effect. You get initial savings, and then the initial savings get translated into increased consumption as it gets translated into increased energy consumption. The best example people always say is if you're driving a car, if you improve the fuel economy standards of the car, then people now can even drive further. So they won't drive the same amount. They actually have more money that allows them to drive the, the rebound. Now, one problem we tend to have in energy efficiency, and I say this, this is relevant because part of our challenge is to change the approach. Every time we have a discussion about energy efficiency and we want to talk about the benefits, Somebody would get up and say, well, what about the rebound effect? What about the rebound effect? Which is a very technical uh, <laughs> issue. It's valid, but very technical. And it's sort of like, you know, we find ourselves tripping over these highly over-intellectualized technical issues without really first having looked at the fundamental point. Yes, there is a rebound effect, but there still is a benefit, and the benefit is still only larger than the rebound, rebound effect. So multiple benefits approach actually helps shed some light on this. The first is, Yes, we recognize the rebound effect can be a negative. In other words, improve the fuel efficiency of cars. You're not going to get all the savings you want because people don't drive more. That's bad. You probably, they won't probably consume as much oil as they did before, but you don't get the savings that you want. You get smaller savings. But having said that, rebound effect can be a positive. So let's go back to that family I was just talking about. Now they have 10 pesos more a month. Again, the same amount of service out of their refrigerator and lighting. And they've got 10, 10 pesos more a month to spend. And they're going to go out and probably spend it on something that supports that family. That's poverty alleviation. That's supporting development. That's a positive. Some of it may go into energy issues. Let's be clear. We all know that in wealthier countries, people spend more on energy than in very, very poor countries. There's a development side related to this. Rebound can be a positive effect because it can support maybe that uh, their kids uh, can spend more time because the light's on later studying and things like that. So rebound effect is not always a negative. It can also be a positive. And the other thing is a lot of the impacts are actually not related to the rebound effect at all. So when I gave the example about health, if you're sick less, there's no major energy consumption issue. Oh, yeah, there's some de minimis. Maybe you're sick less or you're sick more. You may use, uh, you may use your car more or less. But the fact of the matter is for the health people, the objective is not energy. The objective is improving the welfare of the population. And in that case, energy efficiency has a positive impact. Rebound in terms of energy consumption is an obsession for the energy specialists, maybe at most, not the health specialists. And one thing that's critical is when we think about energy efficiency from a multiple benefits perspective, we have to recognize that what we're looking to do is validating the objectives of other people where energy consumption is not necessarily the issue. So in some ways, the rebound effect is not relevant. If you look at a variety of these things, poverty alleviation, we have some of them. Uh, is it really a rebound effect? Asset value doesn't have an impact. Energy delivery, energy security, the, the impact is, is de minimis. So one important issue, and I spent a lot of time on this, is because the moment we started wanting to talk about 
benefits of energy efficiency, all, a lot of the specialists started bombarding us and saying, you have to talk about the rebound effect. The fact of the matter is, much more important than the rebound effect in this context is the variety of benefits that it generates. So, now getting a little more practical. So this is kind of, for us, some of the theory of it, but this all comes from a strategic repositioning of, of energy efficiency. For us, the critical issue is we want to tailor to national power. Different countries are going to want to do energy efficiency for different reasons. Some will be poverty alleviation and development. Some will be greenhouse gas emissions. A lot of job creation. Fuel imports is a big issue. Uh, arguably, it's relevant in the Mexican context. I can tell you they're talking a lot about that issue in Ukraine. <laughs> so the key issue isn't so much looking at multiple benefits. Energy efficiency has 15 benefits. As somebody once say, the best killer of any policy proposal is to have too many benefits. Rather, what we're saying is you focus. It's a question of focusing in particular context, figuring out who are the appropriate stakeholders. So, if your objective is health, if that's what's <laughs> resonating in your country, then working the air pollution issue indoor and outdoor is critical. I promise you, in the case of China, health is a big, and outdoor air pollution is a big issue, and that's what's driving a lot of the energy efficiency side. It might be development, the issue of energy access, and poverty uh, alleviation is important. So working with uh, social ministries and working <coughs> with um, um, ministries that are involved in uh, economic development can be then the right partner for a senior and others who are promoting energy efficiency. And just to point out that when it comes to developing countries in particular, energy efficiency provides a lot of important areas that we at the IA we tend to focus less on. So one is this whole issue about energy access uh, in, in India, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, even in Peru as I look to extend out. People need to be thinking about ways to reducing losses in the existing grids. Less of an issue, obviously, uh, in, in Mexico, but let's be clear, I think if you think back five or six or seven years at the time that, that Luis and Fresa and the merger with CFG, there was a lot of inefficiency in the delivery system uh, that obviously was undermining uh, and providing electricity to people. Economic development, it supports economic growth. And again, that's for us a big message. Industrial productivity, uh, improved trade, uh, balance of trade and the like. Energy efficiency is an important way to promote economic growth. It helps to fight poverty alleviation by improving affordability for poorer households, the health impact for poorer households, poverty alleviation. Combating local pollution, air pollution, that's an obvious one. Um, and obviously climate change, actually resilience, not just mitigation. The fact of the matter is the fewer energy assets you have, uh, because you can provide the same services with fewer assets means the fewer assets that you have exposed to extreme weather events. And then finally, one, one last thought. You know, uh, I was talking to one of our colleagues and I said, well, what is energy efficiency for you? How do you define energy efficiency? And they said energy efficiency for them means doing more with less. And I said, well, you know, when you look at countries that uh, face certain growth and poverty challenges, the issue isn't a question of doing more with less. I mean, working from my, my understanding was part of the energy reform in Mexico wasn't a question of trying to get less oil out of Cantoral and less oil to offshore. It was to try to get more oil so that Mexico would have more resources to further promote even greater uh, economic growth and uh, increasing income per capita. Uh, it's my understanding that the Mexican government doesn't necessarily feel that the income per capita in the country is at the optimum level. Is that right? So there's clearly a desire for growth. So it's not so much a question of doing more with less. It's really a question of doing even more with more. Figuring out where all those other reasons. There could be solar, and that's all the great, putting even more solar panels everywhere. I know Mexico did an interesting study about putting solar panels on all the schools, taking advantage of even all the natural resources you have so that you can do even more with more. That's what energy efficiency is about. Uh, so it's really a question of looking beyond uh, energy savings to raising standards of living efficiently. And this uh, is the book that we have on it. Uh, I have a copy here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias.
por esta, por esta presentación. Eh, ahora tenemos un, un espacio para, para preguntas y respuestas. Eh, tenemos también algunas personas que se encuentran en, en el webinar online. Más de, hay 54, 54 personas participando desde fuera en diversas partes del del país, lo cual nos da nos da mucho gusto, además de las casi 50 personas que se encuentran en este recinto. Así que si gustan, mientras vamos recibiendo las preguntas de eh, nuestros colegas que se encuentran en línea, empezamos con algunas preguntas aquí de la, de la audiencia. Eh, Filip, quiero compartirte que además del de, de equipo de mi oficina, del equipo de la CONUE, están participando también en la audiencia gente de Pemex, del Instituto de Investigaciones Eléctricas, de las agencias de cooperación como GIZ, como USA, eh, entre otras que se encuentran aquí. Así que eh, pues sean todos bienvenidos una vez más. Eh, iniciamos con la sesión de, de preguntas y respuestas. Eh, ahora sí que hablando de los, de los eh, Senior Energy Efficiency Experts, como comentabas, Tú, creo que me toca darle primero la palabra a nuestro Senior Energy Efficiency Expert, que es Odón de Bueno. Así que, no sé si tienes alguna pregunta. Muchas gracias, maestro. Pero bueno, yo le preguntaría la misma pregunta para el público. Uh, ¿Por qué no co-beneficio? ¿Por qué? Basically, we, we talk about this privately, and I would like now to ask a question publicly. I already um, got the answer, and it's very clear. But I would like you to uh, share with everybody now after I go on this microphone. Why we call it multiple benefits? Why not for benefits? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the the reason we we call it uh, multiple benefits and not co-benefits uh, has to do really uh, with the history of co-benefits. So we started on this work about about two years ago, two and a half years ago. And and I will say, as I often say, uh, one of the reasons that uh, I was very interested in this work had to do with work that I had done. Uh, with the World Bank and Sinair in Mexico right before I joined uh, the IEA because we had worked with the Mexican government um, and Canoe on this very ambitious program uh, that replaced 25 million uh, incandescent bulbs and I can't remember, 1.5 million appliances, I forget the yeah. So a very, very successful program and I actually can remember having discussions uh, with your secretary, uh, Secretary of Energy and, and, and others uh, talking about the fact that it's amazing anytime you do an economic analysis of energy efficiency operations it's the, the returns are extremely extremely high but we have a major problem getting people to be interested in it uh, and sort of uh, bemoaning the fact that part of the problem is a presentational issue that people tend to be not as fascinated by energy savings per se there's a question we needed to translate this into other metrics and another benefits including dollars or pesos. So when I got to when I got to the IA, a lot of what uh, the unit was doing in terms of energy efficiency was very oriented around climate change. And every time they would talk about they would talk about energy efficiency produces energy efficiency and then the co benefit and the co benefit tended to be climate change. And I said, well look, we've got a couple of problems here. The first thing is the whole approach here is to recognize that energy efficiency produces different savings, different benefits that are of different importance to different people. And implicit in the notion of co-benefit is that there's a primary benefit and there's a secondary benefit to co-benefit. Well, like if you go to the health example, if you want to have a conversation with the Ministry of Health, for them, their co-benefit is not improved health. That is the benefit. Reduced energy savings is a co-benefit. So it was a question of sort of, of, of recognizing that we need to have an approach that responds to the interests of the stakeholder that we're trying to engage with, not our own pre pre preconceptions. So it isn't so much a question of co-benefits, it's rather a question of multiple benefits. And then the other sort of hidden advantage, it also pulls us out of uh, a nomenclature that is tending to dominate a lot of the climate discussions. Because I think 
we all we all recognize uh, that uh, while climate change can help push the agenda, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, that often people get very concerned if they hear, well, the objective of energy efficiency is climate change. And people forget that from our perspective, we're not a climate agency. Our objective in promoting energy efficiency is promoting energy security, economic growth, and sustainable. So there's a, there is a climate co-benefit, but it's not the only benefit or necessarily the most important benefit. Muchas gracias. ¿Alguna pregunta más de la audiencia? Adelante. Gracias, José Néstor, por nombre de Ecológica. Guardianos, hemos estado viendo los beneficios y los beneficios en este momento. Eh, hemos estado enfocados en tratar de demostrar que esto incluye una mayor competitividad a la empresa, reduciendo los costos, generando valor a los y como un poco de beneficio, simplemente reduciendo los gases de Mucha gente en la estructura lo conoce y lo sabe. Pero cuando existen limitaciones de los recursos, de los presupuestos, normalmente esas tareas de ciencia de química pasan a un suelo. En principio, vamos a conocer otras perspectivas de todos los beneficios que tienen. Pero aún así, cuando llega ese nivel de decisión, es el cero. ¿Cuál es su recomendación para poder garantizar esa visión de prioridad de la empresa con el Ok, so, um, before I answer, let, let me make an observation. Um, energy efficiency is not simply about demand side interventions. It's not simply about end use. There's a lot that can take place in terms of supply side energy efficiency. And so I'm glad you've asked the question from, from Pemex. And in some ways it goes to the fundamental answer, and then I'll, I'll build to it, is we need to change people's attitudes. So uh, I think what tends to, what you've described happening in Pemex is the type of thing we see in a variety of, of, of enterprises. The first thing is theoretically, notionally, what, what any corporation should be doing it, when they're analyzing different places where they should put their money, they should do uh, an internal rate of return analysis and they should rank the projects and then make a decision based on that rational basis. Uh, I think what we tend to find is even though energy efficiency projects can have extremely high rates of return, they don't tend to be rated high and they don't tend to be pushed. Uh, now, I think one of the reasons for that is, is the reality that, for example, in a company like uh, in a company like Exxon or Pemex or Petrobras or Castle, it's it's run by oil experts, petroleum experts who know how to do their business very well, and they're very used to analyzing projects that involve those technologies. So, from their perspective, arguably, there's a lower risk in doing an investment in something that they know as opposed to doing an investment in something that they almost know but they don't necessarily feel as comfortable with. And so I think part of the issue is this, there's just an attitude problem that we need to overcome. And part of uh, our effort to overcome it comes from a variety of things. The one is increasing people's familiarity with it. I'll tell you a story. I, I, I worked with CFE on the evolution of wind power, integration of wind power into the Mexican grid. Um, and the first project that we were doing with CFA was probably in about 2007, 2008, uh, and we got a lot of resistance. There was a lot of resistance, and I was getting a lot of resistance too, from CFA who said, we don't want to integrate, you know, two megawatts, three megawatts of wind power into our system. The dispatch is different and the like. Come back five, six, seven years later, you've got 2,000 plus or whatever megawatts of power to Oaxaca and other places. Part of what happened, and I saw it, was that at a certain point, CFA would be saying to me, we want to integrate more and more wind. We want to do more wind. So part of it is getting industry used to doing things differently. Part of it also we believe, and we're hoping that our efforts at promoting the capturing the multiple benefits is, is important. One of the critical issues, I think, for companies, and some, one, that, one that's as large as Pemex, is really to consider developing a product line 
that has to do with energy efficiency. Because often one of the issues of energy efficiency is you actually get it across the interplay of a variety of product lines, from boilers interacting with compute with uh, the systems, and all, as opposed to a lot of time you have horizontal systems that aren't as well uh, equipped. But it's clear, and I know Pemex has thought about this in the facts, there are a lot of cogeneration opportunities that are provided. There's a lot of venting of gas and things like that, where there are real opportunities uh, for Pemex to do highly profitable investments in energy efficiency. So I wish you the best of luck, and if we can help in any way, because it's obviously uh, for our common good. Tenemos una, una de las preguntas en línea que dice que si es importante, Milton Muñiz, que si es importante tener beneficios fiscales con la eficiencia energética. So, is it important? Is it important yes. to have uh, fiscal benefits? Yes. Energy efficiency? Yes. I think, I mean, so th there, there, there are a couple of things. One of the things, as I mentioned a little earlier in the slide on, on public budgets, and I talked a little less about the macro side, there are major uh, fiscal benefits that you can get from uh, energy efficiency. One of which is, by, is that basically there is an energy efficiency service uh, producing business uh, that will generate uh, sales tax revenues. That is actually often uh, an important benefit that you can get by, from promoting energy efficiency. But the other thing is if you take fiscal benefits maybe a little broader, which is that ultimately fiscal benefits are really part of the public sector to balance inflows and outflows. And one thing that we see uh, is that energy efficiency in public buildings and the like uh, enable the public sector to waste, I put that in parentheses, to, spend, to overspend less on energy consumption, which gives them more money to spend on other things or reduces their need to have higher tax levels. So energy efficiency, uh, promoting energy efficiency can have bo very positive impacts uh, on the government's balance sheet. And then another related point is when you think in particular about the transport sector, urban transport and the like, this is clearly an area where concerted efforts by ministries of transport to develop efficient systems can benefit everybody. The BRT outside is an illustration of an effort to improve the efficiency of the transport system. And that has major fiscal implications. Obviously, there are costs, but normally very high paybacks. Una última pregunta de la audiencia, Ana Contreras, de USA. Eh, muchas gracias por su presentación. Eh, mi pregunta va enfocada en hasta dónde debemos de llegar o cuántos beneficios debemos de considerar eh, para, para poder evaluar eficiencia energética. Eh, yo he trabajado mucho tiempo en contaminación del aire. Eh, sin embargo, si te vas contaminante por contaminante, eh, encuentras muchos, muchos beneficios. Si te vas en aspectos sociales, también encuentras muchos beneficios. Hay metodologías para poder evaluar cada uno de los beneficios. Entonces, la pregunta, eh, ¿hasta dónde van mis límites de evaluación? ¿Qué es lo que debo de realmente considerar para, para evaluar? Ok. No, no, I understand. So, yo voy a, yo voy a responder, respuesta. Responder en español. Uh, bastante, pero no demasiado. <laughs> I mean, it becomes a very specific case. I think it's, it's clear, and a comment I made, is if you go out and say, Here's this policy we want to do to improve efficient air conditioners, and it has 20 benefits. You lose your audience. You really have to be strategic, and you have to target, and you want to pick the ones where you get the biggest bang. Normally, what you'll tend to find is energy efficiency will generate a significant benefit almost in and of itself in terms of energy savings and the like. And then the critical question becomes strategically, who is the best? Uh, potential um, uh, alliance. So the reality is, in most countries, the ones who control most of the decisions are some combination of hacienda and defense. 
So, uh, and defense can be both external and internal. So, uh, the, the link to defense isn't always so clear. I guess, and in some ways, you're from USID, I'm from the United States. Let me tell you, defense always flies in the United States, you know. This is why people love shell gas and shell oil, because it sounds like energy independence and energy security, and people don't question it so much. I live in Europe now. They don't worry quite so much about defense issue. But clearly, ministries of finance uh, are really the key partners, and it's a question of figuring out a way of getting them engaged. But a lot of time, for a variety of reasons, they're going to focus on other issues, sometimes even depending on their own uh, educational background. So places like ministries of health can often be can often be critical. Part of it really depends on what's going on in your country. Beijing, the air pollution's a mess. They know it. Everybody sees it. And in, and in China, they have an issue because they're getting richer, and a lot of people there are very rich, and all those rich people come out, and they've got to breathe the really polluted air of Beijing. So now the government's under a lot of pressure to do something. But I also can think of, I remember, I was, I was actually once uh, uh, on the top floor of the Pemex office about five years ago, talking with the senior executive of Pemex. And it was very interesting because he said he hadn't been there very well. And he looked out the window and he said, he said wow, I can see those mountains. You, you didn't used to be able to see those mountains over there. And so he was, he was talking about uh, the improvement in air quality in Mexico. So, you know, 15 years ago was a big issue. I can't quite tell whether it's as big an issue today. But part of the thing is strategically to find what is going to resonate with the public and with the politicians and then to engage the people, to find the right, the right items. In the UK, they happen to have a lot of push around issues of, of fuel poverty. That's a big issue for them, uh, the fact that poor people are getting squeezed by higher uh, fuel costs and like. So they have a lot of programs that are designed to deal with that issue specifically. So it's a question, uh, not too many, but just enough to get you over there. <laughs> y una, <coughs> perdón, una última pregunta de nuestros colegas en línea de Gonzalo Montemayor, de la CONUE, dice, could municipal institutional strengthening improve energy efficiency at local levels? Yeah, and I think uh, there the issue is, uh, it becomes very, this is where I think government and associations have a big role to play, because I, it's not really reasonable or efficient or to expect every municipality uh, to be able to develop their own energy efficiency unit that has enough people in there. So what you really want to do is you want it to be able to use economies of scale. You want to create a support system. You want to create an affiliation, an association where basically municipal different municipalities uh, can get together with two or three experts and share experience and bring the experience back, as well as arguably developing, let's say, for want of a better word, a SWAT team maybe from uh, Sanir or somewhere else, that can go out and identify, okay, which are the municipalities that are really eager, willing, uh, and able to put forward a program. We'll send them some resources to enable them to do it. And then that will promote replicability. Muy bien. Pues una vez más, muchísimas gracias a todos nuestros colegas en línea, a todos los que se encuentran aquí presentes. Sin duda, en nombre de la Secretaría de Energía, de la CONUE, Felipe, es un honor tenerlos aquí. Estos webinars que, que iniciamos el año pasado con las 25 recomendaciones de eficiencia energética de la Agencia Internacional de Energía y ahora sobre esta publicación de cómo eh, conocer los, los mejores beneficios múltiples de la eficiencia energética, pues sin duda han sido, han sido un éxito gracias al apoyo de, de tu persona, de tu equipo y estamos seguros que seguramente tendremos más, más webinars. No siempre podremos tener a, a, a Philip aquí en México o alguno de los otros expertos de la agencia, pero... I'm happy to come back any time. No. <risa> pero pero tenemos, tenemos afortunadamente eh, la, la tecnología que nos permite eh, hacer estos webinars y que eh, afortunadamente han estado eh, saliendo muy bien, así que una vez más en nombre de todos nosotros muchísimas gracias, gracias a CFE, a Pemex, a todas las agencias de cooperación que se encuentran aquí presentes o en línea y, y a la LENER, etcétera por, por estar aquí y, y seguramente tendremos muchos webinars más a lo largo de, del año. Gracias Filip por, por esta presentación. <laughs> <laughs> we
no more work. <laughs> Thank you.